uh, welcome uh, everybody. Delighted you could join us uh, this evening for the launch of Matt Hearn's book, What a City is For, Remaking the Politics of Displacement. Uh, my name is Pam Jo Hall. I'm director of SFU's Ben City Office of Community Engagement. Uh, delighted that you could join us uh, on a rainy uh, Friday evening. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that we're on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank the other presenters uh, this evening, uh, including the Institute for the Humanities, Samir Gandisha, the director, uh, is here. SFU Urban Studies, where Matt also teaches, uh, SFU Library, UBC School of Community and Regional Planning, and MIT Press, uh, who published the book. And a, a big thank you also to Pulp Fiction, uh, who's here selling uh, the book in, in, the back of the, in the back of the room. <clears throat> uh, Matt is a, a, a dear friend, and it's absolutely, um, I'm really excited for this book, because I think it really culminates on a lot of thinking Matt has been doing uh, in, uh, in this city, but broadly, uh, here in, in East Vancouver, he has been doing a remarkable community organizing work. Uh, even in his uh, own home where his family uh, is here tonight, but there must be over 100 people that have lived in that house over the course of 25 years, so there must be uh, dozens of people here uh, from there as well. But uh, Matt has been a pillar of, of uh, the community and, and so many things that he's done, and it's, it's great to see this book come out with a press like MIT, and I think it's going to be doing uh, a lot of discussions are, are going to be raised by uh, what's, in, what's in the book. Uh, the format for this evening, uh, after uh, I, I introduce Matt to, to say a few words, we'll be moving uh, uh, on to the panel uh, after that. We won't be doing a Q&A, but all of the, the panelists uh, will be here for another hour or so, and the bar uh, and reception area will be, will be open as well. And there will be uh, an after party at Shamam Restaurant over at Hastings and Penticton afterwards, uh, which are also uh, welcome to uh, join us at. Um, most of you in this room already know Matt, you're either former students or you've lived in this house, uh, but he's uh, lived and worked in East Vancouver Coast Sales Territories for the past two and a half decades with his partner and daughters. He's founded and directed the Purple Thistle Center, Car Free Vancouver Day, Groundswell Grassroots Economic Alternatives, and 2 Plus 10 Industries, among many other community projects. He holds a doctorate in urban studies and his books have been published on all six continents. As I mentioned to him before, that's just another way of saying he's never been published in Antarctica. <laughs> <clears throat> Currently teaches in CBU's MBA program, SFU's Urban Studies Department, and, he, and he's an adjunct professor in UBC's School of Community and Regional uh, Planning and he lectures globally. Please uh, join me in warmly welcoming Matt Hurt. <laughs> Well, that was really sweet. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks so much for coming here tonight, guys. That, uh, it's really sweet, and I really appreciate you coming on on a Friday night. Um, so uh, I, uh, I just got a couple of things I'd like to say to start. And, uh, and the first thing uh, is to acknowledge that we're on Coast Salish territory, on the traditional and unceded and occupied territory, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh folks. And that actually is kind of the starting point of this book, is to try to think about that which gets said sometimes very meaningfully, sometimes kind of blithely, but to try to think about what that actually means and to use that as a starting point for an investigation into displacement. Um, and I also would like to uh, acknowledge as well the, uh, the ironies of this kind of book uh, being launched in this kind of place. Um, this is a, a spectacular space, and I'm uh, tremendously grateful for being here um, uh, and for the use of it, and it's a, it's a really nice place to hold all kinds of events. Uh, but this is also, uh, as you know, this is also Woodward's. Um, and Woodward's has uh, a long legacy of displacement in this neighborhood. This building itself is responsible for significant amounts of uh, gentrification and displacement, so there's a certain amount of irony about holding a launch here. But there's also another irony here, too, which is that we're sitting in the, uh, in the Gold Corp building here. Um, and, and Gold Corp itself is, is a cartoonishly evil corporation that is responsible for displacement uh, across uh, the Americas, in particular in Central and South America, and even more specifically in Honduras and Guatemala, uh, and tremendously evil displacement uh, that, is, uh, that is unconscionable. So there is a couple of irony, layers of irony. Uh, being on unceded land, being in Woodward's, being in the Gold Corp Center. 
So all of those I would like to acknowledge as well, being part of our experience here tonight. Um, but also, it should be said that uh, that, that experience is mitigated in a in, in certain degree uh, by the great work that the people do here. Uh, so, and Joel, who many of you know and have been to events here and uh, been recipients of his generosity. Uh, but also, uh, Sama, I don't know where Sama is, somewhere, okay. somewhere around here. Okay. Sama back here, Fiorella, and all kinds of people who make this place. Uh, and Melissa, thank you. Sorry, Melissa, my bad. Uh, make it conscionable to be here and to make do so much wonderful work in the neighborhood. So thanks, Mark. Let's give him a hand, shall we? Um, they, I, the great work that these folks do make it possible to kind of live that contradiction, uh, at least tonight anyways. So, so thanks so much, you guys, for your great work. Um, there's also one other thing I want to say before we start, and it's actually a kind of note of, of sadness, which is that my, uh, my first contact in Portland uh, was a woman named Joyce Taylor. Uh, and she was the first person that I ran into in Albina and that I wanted that was unbelievably uh, helpful and kind and generous and helped me understand what had happened to Portland and what had happened to Albina specifically. She was uh, unbelievably sweet and generous to me, having me in her home many times and trying to explain the many things that I didn't understand. And when I thought about this book over the years, and I thought about first writing it and then publishing it, and then I always imagined her sitting here. Um, and she died this summer, um, and I'm just really <coughs> sad she's not here. Sorry, I, I told Glenn I wasn't gonna choke up, so I'm always so fucking sentimental, but <laughs> I, I really miss her, and I really wish she was here today, because I, I, I didn't think that this would happen. I never imagined that this would happen without her here. So. And uh, that's it. Um, but uh, in her absence, I could scarcely be happier with these folks to be here to, uh, to sit in the panel and share and to celebrate this book with me. Um, these are uh, some of my uh, very best friends, some of my uh, closest collaborators, and some of my uh, most trenchant critics. Um, so I have to say to have them all here to respond uh, to this book and to say what they think about it a little bit is fantastic and touching and I'm honored. And honestly, I'm a tiny bit terrified. Um, because as dear and, uh, and trusted uh, friends they are, I also admire them tremendously. So having to hear their first responses uh, to this book and in public is a tiny bit terrifying. Um, so I'm going to sit quietly and hope for the best. Um, but also that, that every book is a, is a, even if it's just one person who wrote it, it's a, it's a collaborative project. Um, and I really hope that all these folks uh, uh, hear their voices uh, in the book because they're, they're in there explicitly, they're in there, they're, they are in there implicitly. But I never would have been able to write the book without all their intelligence and kindness and thoughtfulness. Um, so I hope you, uh, you like and love them as much as I do. So thank you so much, you guys, for coming to do this. Um, so, uh, uh, so I figured we'll, we'll give them each, what, five minutes you guys want to talk? Maybe a turn of talk and maybe Anne, will you start us off? Yeah. You come and talk for a little bit and then uh, after these guys uh, have some comments and I'll uh, say just a couple of small things and then uh, and we have a beer together. Great. Hammer? Good. I'm just going to speak for a, a few minutes so we can get to our our uh, panelists. You know, one thing about a book launch is that it's a celebratory occasion, but partially also it's a kind of opportunity for a roast as well. <laughs> I, I would say this is uh, the best book of Matt's I've ever read, but it's also like the only book of Matt's. I've ever read. <laughs> that's, that's not true. I'm going to get back to it. How many of you here are students of Matt's or former students? Wow, I'm sorry you went through that traumatic experience. <laughs> That's great that you're here this evening. I had a chance to visit Portland with Matt uh, last August as he was doing some final interviews and taking some photographs. And uh, it's really hard to take uh, make time getting down to Portland when he has to take a pee every 15 minutes. That's really uh, yeah. It was a wonderful and interesting uh, trip to walk around uh, Portland uh, with Matt in the neighborhoods that he writes about in the city and to see his genuine curiosity, enthusiasm, the questioning, and being able to meet some of the people uh, he writes about in the book. And also seeing uh, in the many, many visits that he did there uh, how relationships and the trust that he had built up with people, because to get that type of access to tell that story 
uh, requires that uh, kind of relationship. And I really uh, appreciated being uh, around on that, that trip to see uh, the kinds of conversations that, that were uh, emerging and how they also speak back to cities like Vancouver and other pl places. And I think the methodology that Matt uses in his writing, both in this book but other books as well, where he begins with certain questions, uh, moves to real politics and uh, interviews with people and then moving back into the theory in a kind of dialogue that goes back and forth. Uh, it's something that's really interesting as a writing style. And it makes for a compelling, accessible read than a, than a traditional academic book might. And because it's full of real politics that are playing out on the ground in real time, it never remains in a purely theoretical space. Uh, it raises a bunch of new questions related to cities and urbanization, which, you know, particularly in a city, cities like Vancouver and Portland, things are moving very quickly. Uh, it troubles gentrification and looks at different modes and how we define it. It's not just one thing that moves in a, in a particular way, and also that it impacts uh, people disproportionately. Uh, there's a really important part in the book that I really appreciated, which is uh, looking at the distinction between displacement and dispossession, which, which is a, a rich conversation, and Matt, Matt handles it in a very careful and subtle way, and I think it's going to be talked about in theoretical spaces for, for a long time. Uh, questions of decolonization and sovereignty, what constitute it. And he's working with theorists like Giorgio Agamben and also Glenn Coulthard, and I think it's very interesting uh, points that are being made. There's a very interesting area where uh, there's a distinction made between the notion of the refugee and the evacuee. It's a point that Sobey makes in that interview in the book that I think is really important. But at the very central notion is the question of property ownership as an idea. That's what's at stake uh, in the book, if we are to remake the politics of displacement. I'm just going to quote from one piece just to start, uh, start the evening off, uh, where Matt writes, I hope you agree that in a time of accelerating biocatastrophes and grotesque colonial inequalities, we probably shouldn't be relying on real estate agents as moral compasses, nor should we trust their evaluation of what constitutes a just social order. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce then our first uh, uh, speaker, uh, Glenn Coulthard. He's a member of the Yellow Knives Diné First Nation, an associate professor in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program in the Department of Political Science at UBC. He's written and published numerous articles and chapters in the areas of Indigenous thought and politics, contemporary political theory, radical social and political thought. He lives in Vancouver, Coast Salish territories. Uh, his book, Red Skin, White Mass, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of Recognition, he did, she did his book launch uh, here as well. A very, very uh, important uh, book. If you haven't read it already, you, you should. It was released in August 2014. He co-edited the book, Recognition versus Self-Determination, Dilemmas of Emancipatory Politics, which was released in spring 2014 by UBC Press. Uh, welcome, Glenn. <laughs> Years ago. It's good to see so many people come out here. It's not in the spirit of roasting. It's like a well-attended book lunch, but not the most well-attended that I've been participating in. <laughs> <laughs> um, since we've been cut down to five minutes, I'm just going to jump into this. Uh, <laughs> So uh, Matt's wonderful book, What a City is For, is the culmination of decades of not only thinking about, but also organizing around the violence of neoliberalism, structural compulsion to dis or dispossess and displace the most marginalized people and communities in urban spaces. First here as a resident in Vancouver, where Matt has over the years emerged as an anti-institution, institutional presence on the radical left, and more recently in Portland, Oregon, which is the empirical focus of his book. What well, Matt's work does better than any other book like Treatment on Gentrification in North America, to my mind at least, um, does is demonstrate how the ideological rationale and material effects of gentrification in major settler colonial urban centers like Portland and Vancouver are best understood when existing explanatory frames are placed in conversation with the critical literature on settler colonialism, anti-blackness, and indigenous decolonization. Historically, defenders of settler colonialism have tended to either implicitly or explicitly rationalize this dispossession by treating the lands in question as a terra nullius, namely the racist legal fiction that posited indigenous peoples as too primitive to bear rights to land and sovereignty when our ancestors first encountered um, European powers on the continent. 
And this, of course, rendered our societies politically non-existent and our territories legally empty and open for colonial settlement and development, which in Matt's book is the base of any investigation that looks into gentrification in these spaces. Now, of course, commonly defined as the transformation of working class areas of the city into middle class residential or commercial spaces, gentrification has also shown to be structurally prone to dispossession and displacement. Specifically of poor, black, racialized, indigenous, and other marginalized sections of the urban population. In spite of these violent effects, however, developers will often defend their gentrifying projects as a form of improvement, through which previously wasted land, property, and lives are made more socially and economically productive. This neo Lockean rationale has led some scholars to view gentrification through a colonial lens as yet another frontier of dispossession central to the accumulation of capital. What a city is for contributes immeasurably to this emergent conversation. Now to my mind, Matt's intervention is crucial insofar as it highlights not only the class composition of urban redevelopment and displacement, but also sheds light on the manner in which ideologies of race, gender, and state power converge with class in a structural process that shores up the colonial acquisition of lands and resources previously under the care of indigenous nations. As Matt writes repeatedly and unequivocally, quote, thinking about displacement cannot be an isolated exercise. We have to understand specific processes with more, within more broadly historicized and political, politicized contexts. Maybe more bluntly, any attempt to ameliorate displacement are doomed if they are not rooted in an aggressively equitable <coughs> and decolonized politics of land, ownership, and sovereignty. Now, my friend's intervention here is crucial and cannot be stated enough. Although the emergent colonial reading of gentrification has gained some well-warranted attention as of late, to my mind, it has yet to sufficiently reflect on what such an analysis means for how we think about the relationship between anti-gentrification struggle on the one hand and urban indigenous land and sovereignty claims on the other. As I have argued elsewhere, when translated into practice, I suggest that a decontextualized and ahistorical notion of common property threatens to inadvertently treat settler colonial cities as an herb snellius, herb space void of indigenous sovereign presence. Matt avoids, or at least really attempts, works hard to avoid replicating this originally or originary violence in anti-gentrification activism by placing colonialism at the center of both his critique but also his vision of a just city. What for Matt would constitute a quote aggressively equitable decolonized politics of land ownership and sovereignty look like? As a good anarchist that he is, to start uh, we would have to do away with ownership in its current hegemonically institutionalized form. Quote, conversations about tenure can be approached in multiple ways, writes Matt, but the most promising possibilities for better, more ecological urban relationships will lie in removing land and all of its senses from the speculative marketplace and seeing the collective achievements of land value commensurately common. This seems more or less correct to me, although I would add that it needs a further qualification. Namely, that a more equitable system of land tenure, one in which land value is commensurably common, yet at the same time, uh, does not invoke the commons in a way that ahistorically erases indigenous peoples with land, as expressed through their customary legal orders, requires an unequitable or unequal distribution of sovereignty. In settler colonial contexts like Portland and Vancouver, the violent dispossession at the root of gentrification didn't only result in the coarse transfer of a thing or commodity, i.e. land, from one party, indigenous peoples, to another party, property owners sanctioned and protected by the state. It, was violently, it violently uprooted the indigenous social relationships of place, politics, and law that once governed relationships be between people and our other than human neighbors in a radically more, or, or sorry, in a, uh, oh, I was on a roll there. <laughs> it violently uprooted the indigenous social relations of place, governance, and law that once governed relationships between indigenous peoples and our other than human neighbors, neighbors in a radically more equitable and sustainable manner. In this sense, I think that the restoration of this sovereign authority must res be restored in the city. So it's not just a question of this, uh, the uh, transfer or the, the uh, commoning of, of land holdings and value, uh, but a reinstatement of the legal order, the social relations and uh, jurisdictional sort of aspects of this place that were also erased 
uh, through the violent settler colonial dispossession and displacement of indigenous peoples. So thank you. Uh, when the next uh, speaker is Josiane Anthony. She's currently studying law and sociology with an interest in refugee and immigration issues. She's a program coordinator leading refugee youth programs for Immigrant Services Society and the Vancouver Foundation's youth advisory team. She served as national youth arts coordinator for the Mikel Jean Foundation and is creator and evaluator of BC Youth Toolkit for the Ministry of Children and Family Development. She's also the co-founder of the Black Before February Arts Collective and event and co-editor of From the Root Scene. Please uh, welcome Josiane. <laughs> well, thank you, Anne, and thanks, Matt, for <laughs> asking me. It's a privilege to be on here. And just so you all know, as you can see, I'm the only student here <laughs> supporting me on like study mode. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know Matt, and it's a privilege to know Matt as a student and as a young person. He's really well. As I'm already said, he pees every 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, but I need to get a class, you know. And I don't even know how he goes through his lectures. But he pees so much, and he's a great doctor as well. You know, Matt will get you if you're sick. Do not tell Matt that you'll be healed instantly. Um, to get on it, a city. Thank you for that book. I was I was telling Matt, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm gonna say, and I'm not gonna read the book. I told him I'm not gonna read the book, and he's like, you're not reading the book. But yeah, <laughs> so as he already said, there's, we all find a bit of us in that book. And for me, as someone who I've always told him, I'm not into this white environmentalism shit. Yeah, I'm the first person to curse, sorry. And I'm not into this, what is urbanism? I don't know, I don't care. But anyways, I just saw myself in this book, and I'm telling you that I'm fine. So reading this book, as someone whose entire childhood and teenage life was lived in a refugee camp, I am reminded of home and what that is. The intersection of displacement and identity, or more so um, the sense of belonging, when one has been moved around so many times, not, not by choice, there is this lost sense of belonging to a particular place. When you're frequently, well, what, uh, what came to mind as I was writing is when you frequently get asked the question of where you're from, where are you from? Um, that brings the feeling of uh, displacement and being displaced. As someone who came, who grew up in a refugee camp, where my people were forced, uh, were removed from the island forcefully into a refugee camp, where I grew up, Senzuli refugee camp in Ghana, we were placed in a part of uh, the country that is the poorest, the poorest part of the country. And as the book mentions about uh, the neighborhood of Baina, where uh, majority of the black folks live in in Portland, and where you know forcefully moved from there because of gentrification. This reminds me a lot about home, and the only home I've known uh, as a young person is the refugee camp in Ghana. And here, but again, the refugee camp is more where I can like relate to. But knowing that I was born somewhere, and, and I do not know that place, but because my people were forced to live there uh, uh, because of economic and political reasons, and and then put into uh, the very poorest part of the nation where we do not have any sort of relationship with the citizens over there, or, um, or we do not have the means of even affording things in that area. Everything is so expensive, and as a refugee, I don't know about you, but <laughs> you can't afford anything at all. It's whatsoever the government uh, of the country you're seeking refugee in gives you is what you take, or whatsoever um, UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, provides for you is what you take. Um, so then, I'm reminded of how just the conflict between the locals of, of that place, the, the conflict between us, the refugees, and the citizens of Ghana, of my refugee campus in Ghana, and how constantly they, they remind us and say, hey, you refugees, go back to where you come from. Or um, I remember one incident where they came and uh, they, they sent in a truck full of army men and navy guys who were high on drugs to beat everybody in the camp. 
And my mother actually was the very first person that was beaten. And till today, she still has the mark. And I just tease her for it. I'm like, damn, your butt is big now. Because <laughs> so she, she had like 15 men beating her uh, from, um, because the, their intention was to, to, you know, close down the camp and, 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 and build it into something else, you know. They were trying to improve in that part of that, that city. Uh, it, we were sort of in a desert area, and they didn't know that anything or whatsoever thing could happen in that area until they found out. They just brought these Navy guys and Army men to beat everybody, and they burned down the only source of um, the place where we, we, we would go and get food. They burned down that whole place. Oh, so as I go through my book, I, I, I'm, I'm reminded, so that was home for me, and that home was burnt, and that home... Uh, I mean, I get, I'm, I'm here in Canada today, it's a privilege, but I didn't choose to come to Canada. The government brought me to Canada. Um, I mean, I could have been in Australia, I could have been in New Zealand, whatsoever, any other white man's land. <laughs> but I'm here today. Uh, I mean, na native land, to be precise, but I don't like talking about native as I mean, this building, I already covered that part. Um, so I'm reminded of all of that, and I was thinking to myself, how then, why then didn't I have a say in as to where I am going? The same way I'm thinking of the book, uh, uh, how I was asking Matt though, I, when I was reading through, I asked him why, and for me, I'm one of the critics, I will ask, I'm like, what is this, urbanism, I don't get this shit. So, <laughs> but I get this part. Why are young people, uh, black folks being forced out of, I'm not an American, I don't, I don't have any sort of American experience, but as a black woman from, the continent and having the same experience of being forced from a land that I do not know and, in, and being disposed into somewhere that nobody knows about and being brought here without anybody's concern. That sort of like, I, I, I had to put myself in the shoes of these people in Portland and I've, I've actually never been to Portland but I think after this I'm gonna visit. Um, and it's, it saddens, it saddens me. I think after reading this book, I, I would like to do more. Honestly, I would like to try to learn more about urbanism and, and gentrification, just because I see how it personally affects affect me too. I haven't thought of it in that way uh, as to uh, as someone in a refugee camp. All I wanted is a good life, and I'm happy that I left the camp and I'm here. But then as I think about it, I read the book I'm gonna have. My people are still there, I still have friends and families there, and they're being forced to leave that place, but they have nowhere else to go. So if one day they decided to break down that whole camp and shut it down and, I don't know, turn it into a market, then their life is over as the life of the people in this book is pretty much. So uh, it's, uh, thank you, Matt, by the way, and it's taught me, it's actually opened my eyes and, and make me look back <laughs> where I came from and to appreciate, you know, I'm not gonna be all like, I'm not environmentalist and shit anymore. I'm gonna think about it. <laughs> so uh, quickly just to add on, are you timing me or not? Because I no, could just no, go no. on. <laughs> Good show. Um, okay. Your show. Yeah, so like I was saying, in, in my refugee camp, um, that I was there for about 12 years. We were, we, we, we <laughs> 12 years of being in refugee camp, all I've known. That's been the only home I've known. And I, I try, I try to make this place my home. Uh, when people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from Surrey. Um, and again, Surrey is like my second home. I grew up there. I came here when I was 17. So, but now that I think about it, as I'm reading this book and I was telling him, I was like, you know what? People always say all the bad people, all the gangs, all the refugees, all the immigrants are in Surrey. But now I see all these people coming down to Surrey to take over. We don't want you all in Surrey. Please stay here in Vancouver. You know, because Surrey is the, the it's been the affordable place to, to live in, even though somehow, uh, the government, I don't know, but when you come here as a new person, you go to Welcome House. Welcome House sends every refugee to Surrey or like that Burnaby area. Uh, and all of a sudden, I'm seeing all these high rises in Surrey. I'm seeing all these uh, buildings, all these condos, and they're expensive. Now, a room in Surrey is like thousand bucks. Like, why? I don't have that money. I'm a student. It's like they're trying to little by little drive away all these immigrant and refugees that are trying to make home in that city, uh, and all of this, this book does just spring forth all of these, um, you know, 
things for me to think about. See what what's what's the next project we're gonna do. We should write. We should do Surrey. We should totally <laughs> make the government do Surrey. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Josiane. The next uh, speaker is Sobi El Zobaidi. He's a restaurateur host of tonight's after party, <laughs> novelist, poet, and independent filmmaker currently working on his doctorate at SFU. Mr. El Zubaydi was born in Jerusalem, raised in Jalazan refugee camp near Ramallah, and educated at Berziat University in Palestine and NYU in the US. His films address the realities and complexities of contemporary Palestinian life, the disruptions and humiliations of everyday existence lived under Israeli occupation, in refugee camps and in the troubled enclaves of the West Bank and Gaza, and the internal fragmentation and divisions that afflict Palestinian society. Welcome, so It's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, to share this moment with uh, with Matt and his friends. Uh, this is uh, promises to be an, uh, a beautiful book. I didn't read the whole thing, <laughs> I confess. But I had uh, many long conversations with Matt about his thoughts and what drives him to write this book, his concerns. And, uh, I read uh, the chapter, the first chapter of the book. Uh, I'm also, uh, there are so many things that make, uh, concerns me with space, generally speaking. The first thing is that being Palestinian, we have such a unique experience with space. Because not only we are refugees, we are refugees, we are exiled, we are dispossessed, displaced, evacuees. Whatever you can imagine, it really applies. You can apply it to the Palestinian people. So we combine a unique spatial experience in this world that intelligently, philosophically, politically, has not yet completely been cultivated or brought in discussion, especially in the Western world. It is our spatial orientation and coordination in the world that we construct our sense of identity. Uh, I'll explain myself in an example. Uh, during, through my studies of space, uh, I came to the conclusion from all the sources that I read that the space is conceived as the articulation of our presence in space. Our memory, our sense of feeling, who we are in, uh, in the world, is really all a network of relations that organize our presence in this world. This is why I know this is a chair, this is uh, a building, I am here in, in, in uh, as a view. It's so space is at the core of our sense of identity. Space is at the core of our sense of who we are in the world. We cannot be spaceless. We have to always negotiate a sense of presence in space. We Palestinians, and I can like for in poetry, in literature, in here and there, there are like in Africa, in Latin America, the, the Aboriginal people, there are so many different articulations, artistic, cultural, whatever, that negotiate, that represent, that describe, that articulate this displacement. But in inner cities, what happens? What happens to people who are displaced or dispossessed in inner cities? The, the conversation, displacement, refugees, this position is mostly understood or discussed in, in, in the context of imperialism and colonialism. So there is always this, this really, this, we have a very good grasp, a very good understanding of the political economy of colonialism and imperialism and the way it dealt with space. But do we have this vocabulary to describe this kind of <coughs> spatial uh, relationship of taking space from somebody that can articulate what is happening in uh, uh, inner cities, in North American inner cities, for example. And this is why I think uh, Matt's book is a, is a good contribution. 
it, it really brings back the conversation about inner cities problems to be articulated and understood spatially. Spatially means in the real, physical, material world where we live, not in, uh, uh, in theoretical notions or consumerist, you know, notions. It's in the it's, con it's in the concrete, geographical, material world, and I think this is this is important. Because I think when, when, when we discuss whether it's uh, native, aboriginal, displacement, racial, uh, imperial, settler, colonial, we are, uh, we are finally talking about the relationship between geography, between the material world and the constitution of the person or the group or the community or the nation. So, uh, but I find Again, as a, as a Palestinian, I, I feel there is uh, back to, to, to this conversation I had with Matt, and I value this conversation. And he actually quotes another conversation between Elias Samba, a Palestinian historian, and Gulduru's, um a French philosopher, very influential. And they talk about Palestinians as evacuees. Now, you go, you read in various different uh, by different historians or political, uh, cultural bureaucrats or historians, but you find uh, the same people who are described as evacuees, described as refugees, as exiled, as displaced, as displaced. And this is sort of, uh, this uh, back to stress my bond about the Palestinian experience with the space and uh, the need uh, to uh, sort of uh, bring this experience into the, the an overall uh, conversation about about the space. Uh, the other thing I wanted to to another point I I, it brought, I entertained when reading uh, uh, Matt's uh, chapter. Uh, <laughs> the first two pages. I I can't <laughs> The, the same really mechanisms, the same political economy, uh, the same processes that took place, uh, mostly white settler colonialists who went to Africa, the Middle East, here and there, they brought back the, those practices with them. So much of what constitutes land, home ownership, the same colonial mentality, the same imperial mentality, but it has not been translated really. There isn't a vocabulary to, to to, to, to make the connection that it's imperialism brought home, colonialism brought home. Post-colonialism should be, the core of post-colonial studies should be urban Western centers, Western cities, and not third world countries who were colonized already. Post-colonialism should focus on the study of how colonialism, imperialism, when it's brought home, because it's the same bureaucrats, it's the same mentality, it's the same power structure, it's the same regime of power that initiated this whole imperial conquest, is ruling in the land, is ruling the nation, is ruling the country in the name of democracy, in the name of many things. But somehow you can see, like when you read, for example, this. Uh, you know, when I was reading this uh, this afternoon, I, I, I suddenly thought about when somebody loses their home here, here in, in, in uh, Canada or the United States, they don't call it disposition, they call it reposition. The, 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 the focus is on repossessing the bank as the owner, not the, the, the person, the person who has, there is no disposition. It is completely shut down from this, sort of discourse of relationship between land or geography and whoever owns this land. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the, the next uh, speaker is Lisa Bates. She's, she's an associate professor at Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. She does research related to housing policy and planning. Her work is particularly focused on social justice issues, including understanding how inequitable outcomes may arise from institutionalized racism in policy design and implementation. Her research also describes how people of color and low-income households make decisions about housing and neighborhoods 
given their perceived choices and constraints. As a planner, she has conducted research in diverse settings, including Chicago, post-Katrina New Orleans, and Portland, serving as a co-lead for the Technical Advisory Group on Equity and Civic Engagement for the Portland Plan on the Creation Committee for the Office of Equity and Human Rights. She also uh, was a co-lead for the Housing and Communities Committee of the Greater Portland Pulse, a regional indicators project. She sits on the board of directors of the Portland Housing Center, which is one of the nation's top ownership, education, and counseling organizations. Welcome. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna roast Matt at all. I want to say thanks for inviting me um, because my students think Matt is extremely cool and. Like all that you hear, I'm not that cool, but now I'm adjacent to somebody cool, <laughs> and that's great. Um, and you know, to keep it 100, when I first you know heard from Matt and he was coming to Portland, I was like, all right, what's up with this guy? Uh, but to know the amount of time and care and the relationship that you built with uh, Miss Joyce. Um, with May the mayor, with John Washington, not the official mayor, the unofficial mayor of Portland <laughs> Paul Nulls. Um, <laughs> yeah, the real mayor. You, that didn't go that well with that guy. But um, it was really meaningful because that's a group of people who don't, um, they don't lay out the red carpet for just everyone and they don't um, hang with just any white guy. So um, I know that it's, it's the real, real stuff. Um, this is a really exciting moment, actually, for this book to be available in Portland. We're in the midst of an, a really unprecedented housing crisis in Portland, but we're also in an unprecedented moment of organizing and movement building, which for the first time is really actually centering racial justice um, squarely in the center of that conversation and thinking about displacement as a phenomenon that's not just about a loss of housing or a transfer of properties, but as it links um, with the kinds of, of cultural and political dispossession that uh, Matt talks about in the book. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's going on in Portland with relation to black people's um, sense of displacement and dispossession, the kind of like psychosocial, legal, and political condition. Um, my work, in my work there, I think particularly about Clive Wood's notion. Clive Wood a, was a geographer, a black geographer, who talked about the employment of a blues way of knowing. I mean, it could be a hip hop way of knowing for today's era. But to understand um, black geographies, not just to saying, let's define an object of study as a place where we can draw a boundary around inside of which are black bodies, but to understand how black people um, imagine geographies as integral to black life, right? So we can say black lives matter, but we also need to say that black life matters. Mm -hmm. And I think it's um, important to, to speak a bit more about what it means to say black life matters in a condition of blackness as, um, as social death. And I think that the book elucidates really, really clearly about the, the violence of colonialism, of settler colonialism, um, everything that, that Glenn talked about in terms of that, uh, the disruption not only of, of presence on land, but of, of governance of social structures. And I think um, we should also be really clear, um, not just about the violence of sort of a land stolen for people, but for those of us who are descended from Africans brought to the continent to be slaves, that we are a people stolen from land, um, a people stolen from culture, history, in which there was a very deliberate attempt to sever uh, those relationships and in fact to render black people as non-humans. Um, and you know, to, to, to really speak very clearly that for um, the, the concept of chattel slavery in the United States was that of a permanent condition, that no person descended from a body brought to be a slave in America would ever be a citizen, right? Would ever gain citizenship. There, that was the, the force of, of legal and court battles over some hundreds of years. Um, so there was no like future there as a whole human. It was a politically null state. So you could sort of like imagine now in, 
you know, we, we can talk a lot about the attenuated states of, of citizenship for black people in the, in the US, um, but trying to sort of wrangle with the American dream of owning a home and owning land and owning property as a descendant of those who were owned um, is kind of a, like a mind fuck, right? And it's, it's like an interesting dynamic and you can sort of see the ways that black people are trying to negotiate and understand how to think about themselves in that space we still live in a dominant culture that rewards us for owning and claiming and consuming things. Um, and in the conversation about gentrification, it's, it's a black community fighting to stay in a place that they were once forced to live in. So that's also a little bit heady in the mind. And so I think it's really important and, and productive to start to, to bring, um, as I think the book tries to do, to bring our understanding of settler colonialism, the, the land grab and the violence um, against indigenous people of the United States, and then to connect that to the conversation about anti-blackness, slavery, and sort of like how can we work those things together so that we can move into a more productive conceptual framework. And I think that's really important. Um, in, so I can just say a couple things about what's what's up in Albina, what's up for black people in Portland. Um, it's a kick to read a book that says Albina because even in this very short period of time, that name is disappearing. That name is being erased because new people don't say Albina. That's, that's the name you know, on a 1990 urban renewal plan that they don't wanna have anything to do with. So um, you know, we, we have some new, new names coming up. But um, in this kind of blues epistemology that, that black folks in Portland are really like reinscribing the map of the city with a counter narrative there are not very many black people in Portland, right? It's about 80% white cities, about 7% black folks in, inside the city of Portland, um, some of whom are, are more recent um, immigrants or refugees uh, from the continent of Africa now. Um, so for, in terms of that African American community, it's pretty small. And facing there's a, a really severe fragmentation of place right, this displacement that is really widespread. Folks are moving all over the place, including out of the city of Portland altogether to, to Salem, which is about 60 miles down the road. There's this continual recitation of history and creation of a story that's historicized, that's politicized, that's collective, and it's about a generational presence in this particular place that becomes a really a cornerstone of identity formation. Um, and so, you know, if you're, a, if you're a black Portlander, it's to be a black Portlander is to have and to be part of a story of Northeast Portland and to continually lay claim, to continually lay claim to those streets, to lay claim to Jeff High, to lay claim to Dawson Park, to North Williams Ave, um, through this set of stories, this memories that you'll see in gatherings through like a call and response conversation um, hey, remember that? Yeah, what about this? And that remakes Albina as sacred ground for black people in Portland. And it is remaking and making the black community even as it's dis displaced. It's a way to stave off that, that wholesale dispossession. Um, even for young Portlanders, young black Portlanders who never lived in Northeast Portland, their families were you know, pushed out 15 years ago, they can still speak about um, the, the places, the memories, the family histories that they are learning every day, and they very defiantly lay claim to be in those spaces. I will go to Hoopsa Peninsula Park, and I will, you know, take my swag down Mississippi Ave, even though it's hostile territory at this point. Um, and that's like not, those are not really stories for white people. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that, you know, folks who live a couple blocks away from this, the ghost Trader Joe's, the, the potential Trader Joe's site, um, they don't know about it. They don't know that they're living in a place that black people still think is theirs. Um, and, you know, I, I only know a little bit about it and I only find out about it sometimes as a not from here black person in Portland. Um, it's it's a, actually, it's a great privilege. It means that people are trying to bring you into the collective identity. We want you to be part of Black Portland, so we're gonna tell you the stuff so that you know too, and that you can continue to speak these names. Um, but you know, it's a blues, right? Clive was talking about, it's a blues. 
it's, you know, I had it and I lost it. It's a fundamental longing that will not be fulfilled. And that, that's the essence and the root of the blues. Um, so that, like, all that stuff gets really complicated, I think, when you start to think about these very concrete sorts of solutions that I think Matt's book tries to move us into. Um, and I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get in conversations in Portland about the kinds of, of potential actions and potential frameworks to, to move things forward because people are really seeking, they're really groping for some way to do something different, to think differently about uh, property ownership, home ownership, about how to stay in place. Um, and you know, like I don't, I don't really know what should be done about it <laughs> per se. Uh, you know, should black people try to come back to Northeast Portland? Should black people try to embed themselves where they live now? Um, there are there there is a lot of funding and resources coming from the city now. It's now up to sixty five million dollars, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's place bound. It's only in the Albina district, and so that's creating a lot of dissension in the community about whether that should be the goal. Should we are we trying to go back to a place that we don't think um, that other people live now? Um, but I think that there, you know, as we try to move towards something, whether it's more pluralized forms of ownership, more more deeply practiced democracy that's envisioned in the book, that we can also do that by activating more from our collective and community memories. And I think there is a possibility of sort of turning the blues toward stories of resilience, towards stories of collective action, toward a memory of organized community mobilizing and building power for itself, not just of loss, not just of longing. Um, so recovering um, the black community's boycotts of Portland Public Schools, very highly damaging quote unquote desegregation plans, recovering Sisters in Action, a black young women's group that fought and won youth transit passes, um, recovering the Interstate Alliance and Displacement, which was led by black organizers and black tenants to try to stave off displacement um, when the light rail was coming. And, you know, even though those, are, those aren't all wins, right? It's still a blues story. It's about struggles and obstacles and resilience and recovery. Um, but it's, you know, it's about realism. And I think that through that collective memory, we will be thinking about ways to to move forward, to learn from the history of how to move, how to react, how to reassemble, um, and how and to choose how to fight. And so I think this book is is gonna be a really important component of thinking about that vision, thinking about that imagination. And so I thank you, and I look forward to you coming back to Portland so we can talk about it more then. Uh, everyone, now that you've had a chance to hear everyone else speak, it's time to let this white boy speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, should I say just briefly? How fucking gold are those guys, eh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can run over there. A whole lot to say. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, you guys. I really, really appreciate you all taking the time. Thank you. Um, I just have a, just a couple of uh, just a couple of short comments, and I'm going to read just a page for you so you can think of uh, maybe you can get an idea of the tenor of the book, um, which uh, Pulp Fiction is kindly selling back there. Uh, and if you'd like to hear more, uh, all of these folks show up in the book uh, in very specific ways. So I would encourage you to find them at least in there. Um, and, and I guess part of it is is uh, so much of the book is a, is a story of Portland, for sure. Um, but it's kind of only a starting point, because I don't really expect you or anybody else to care all that much about Portland, per se. Um, I don't really care that much about Portland in a lot of ways. Um, it's a great place. It's a great place. <laughs> <laughs> we care about you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. But, <laughs> um, the, but it's such, it was such a... a a stark uh, and, and and kind of shocking story because when you go to Portland, 
you hear about what a great place it is, about how it does urbanism right, how there's so many, you know, the great bikes and beer and places you should go. And then you find this, it doesn't take long to find this unbelievable story. And then to spend some time following it over and spending years just following the story and finding just how stark and kind of awful the story about blind is in all kinds of ways. And then to realize that that same story gets replicated over and over and over again. It doesn't matter what city you go to. You travel the cities across the globe and you find neighborhoods that are telling the exact same story, the exact same stories of displacement, the exact same stories of dispossession. And so often it sounds inevitable. It sounds people are fatalistic about it. Like that's, you know, capital gets what capital wants and uh, the best we can do is kind of hope to get out with, uh, you know, with our clothes on our back and that's it. Um, and to be in, then to begin to think that through and to think it through, yeah, as a story of, of, of longing and a story of sadness and all that, but also to think of it as a story as uh, something else again. And that's what uh, I, I think a lot about what Walida talks about when, when I've spoken to Walida a lot about, about Albina. And to talk about it, he says, yeah, it's a story of, of sadness and yeah, it's a story of suffering, but it's a story of a lot more than that too. Um, and it's not correct to cast people who are being displaced or dispossessed or subject to gentrification as victims. There's a lot more than that. And so I, I really resonate when you talk about people coming back. I, I played a lot of basketball at, at Peninsula Park. And you hear people talk about coming back and to think about ways that we can act in the face of it. Um, in, the fact, in, the, in the face of displacement, that that's not our fate. That's not a natural condition. That's not our fate. We can, we can think through and past uh, the, the, the anxious and kind of uh, grasping uh, proto-certainties of, of ownership and property. We can think past that and we can think through that. And I think if we start thinking about, about rematriations, if we think about decolonization, if we think about, uh, about reparations, that is the right starting point. And thinking uh, through that uh, offers some kind of opportunity to get out of the, the tired narratives of, of gentrification, which seems so certain. Um, and I, and I think in all kinds of ways, thinking about it, thinking about it through listening to, to, to refugees talk, listening to people talk about Palestine or talk about Ghana or talking about the experience of indigeneity here on land and to think about the relationship between displacement and dispossession and what that means uh, has been, uh, uh, it begins to unsettle almost everything I think about, about who gets to be in a place, who gets to speak in a place, who gets to have memories on a place. Um, so for all of that, I, I think that this beginning part, to think about Portland, it's, it's a one story. Um, and it's a story that I think is really worth telling and a lot. But it's so indicative and so illustrative of places in so many parts of the world. Um, but I, I like to think that there's, there's something affirmative we can think through here. And that's where I ended up trying, where I tried to end up uh, is in an affirmative place. A place where we can think about affirmative dialectics. We can think of a way to think through these certainties because they are... They're not given, they're made, and we can, we can think through them. Um, let, me, uh, let me read just a, a short page for you, and then let's, shall we call it. Um, so this is from the last chapter, after I've been, uh, I've been wandering through, uh, I've been wandering through Portland repeatedly, going back to Portland, looking at Portland repeatedly, but also, Albina. this is the last chapter. Uh, I return to Albina once again, with a head full of sovereignty. I walk up and down Mississippi and North Williams repeatedly. I see street signs letting me know I've entered a quote-unquote historic district. I see artisanal boutiques, eco-lofts, handcrafted living, bee-nourished, organic pet stores, many blonde kids and local galleries. I see white sorority types in a new Kia convertible blasting Lil Wayne, the deep bass thump ricocheting off buildings from blocks left and right. I see Louisiana-themed condo loft options, Bayou, Tupelo Alley, the Delta. I see something called vintage real estate. I stop and browse a Portlandia book and think about whiteness. I wander up Alberta Street and see a very attractive mural telling me, you're only confined by the walls you build yourself. I think, fuck you. I, en <laughs> I encourage myself to resist too much hostile cynicism. They're probably nice people, and they probably mean well. They didn't think that one out. <laughs> There's a Mardi Gras parade on Fat Tuesday, heavily advertised in a craft store called Gumbo. Looking for some other kinds of insight, I get an Airbnb for a night in the heart of the neighborhood. The hippie who owns the house mentions in the morning that she has a lot of guarding to do, including lifting some heavy rocks and stuff. She looks at me hopefully, waits an extra beat or two, sort of snuffles and says, well, I'm going to go get a Mexican for the day. I remind myself about the hostile cynicism thing and find the affirmation difficult. The neighborhood is not awful, not even close. It's actually just beautiful, at least in its built form. The scale is admirable. There's a pleasing diversity of building typologies and ages. There's thoughtful transit, bike and pedestrian-oriented developments, walkably spaced mini neighborhood centers. The housing stock is attractive and well-maintained. 
The food trucks pop up serendipitously, and a number of solid community institutions remain, including the spectacular rebuilding center right in the middle of the Mississippi business trip. There's really plenty to admire here, but why are these kinds of design success stories seemingly inevitably on ethnically cleansed ground? I'll stop there. I'll read you one, one other tiny little part. Um, and this is the part where uh, it's after I talk to a whole bunch of city officials who kind of extol to me the diversity of the neighborhood. And I think about uh, new urbanist typologies that, 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 that place diversity right at the center of their kind of ideological orientations. Um, I say that diversity, Jane Jacobs and especially the new urbanists reify, is a misapprehension perversion of difference. What they're calling for is absolutely real and attractive. Lively public realms, complete mixed use neighborhoods, pedestrian transit, bike friendly streets, etc. All of those are desirable built forms. But for those goals to be achieved with any stability or resilience or ethics, they have to be the product of a city that disowns land. Where profiteering and capital accumulation from land is disavowed. Any city that achieves apoliticized but attractive design objectives while allowing its land to be left to the whims of market will inevitably see its successes captured by capital and quickly destroyed or disemboweled. The neoliberal city is a vampiric city constantly sucking the vibrancy out of his neighborhoods and keeping its most alive residents always on the run. Diversity is the heavily, the heavily securitized simulacrum of difference. The city has to unfold onto itself as the creative production of sociability. But a society of difference, I'm sorry, a city of difference can only exist where everyday people are not preyed upon and where land is not abandoned to the market. Which is why I'm tentative about deferring to gentrification as a driving trope of contemporary urban transformation. Antagonism to gentrification all too stri often strikes me as a defensive action, as working from the presumed inevitability of, di of displacement and dispossession, of self-determining subjectivities, and then trying to ameliorate the effects. Cities are uniquely constituted to meet that challenge, and we know how to do that. We know how to effectively remove land from the market. There's every reason to believe that cities could be remade as socially creative bre breaches that by definition seek to decolonially de repair the injustices their existences are predicated on. Predicated on. That's what a city is for. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Big thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, thank you, Matt. And uh, finally, just wanted to say that the after party, the bar in the room will be open for another hour or so. And then the after party is at Tamam at Hastings and Ticket. So thank you. Yep. Come over, folks. Thank you.